some have argued that, you know, 7.7% is, is not optimum for Nigeria. Uh, yes, uh, underperformer, yes, and the reason is for several reasons. Infrastructure is still poor, uh, credit uh, financial deepening is fairly low, a large part of the population is outside the, the banked economy, and uh, there have been, uh, they've, um, so there's plenty of uh, room for improvement. Another area, of course, is that there's a second set of reforms which are currently about to be launched, but this, of course, depends on the elections which mm -hmm. are due. So yes, 7% is uh, fairly, fairly strong performance actually. And it's worth noting that the global credit event, the impact on Niger Nigerian growth is fairly muted. Uh, Nigerian growth remained above 6%. So that was quite creditable. But to take to the next leg, answer your question, uh, yes, a lot of these reforms are needed and they are on the agenda. But uh, as you know, we are entering election mode. Yeah, so things might slow down. But some of the reforms that have been introduced, for instance, um, has seen a new administration really trying to fast-track fundraising for infrastructure, recognizing that this is a huge impediment to investment and to social um, development. What's needed to give impetus to the infrastructure drive? Well, I mean, there, there are two elements, really. One is, uh, is if, if, if you look at the there's power and non-power, on the power side, uh, you have to make uh, market pricing. So people will come in and build a new, new plant and new distribution and transmission uh, equipment uh, systems. So that's the pricing. I mean, there are plenty of investors lined up, but uh, they're waiting for the go-ahead. Uh, beyond, beyond the power, it's, uh, the main constraint is the funding side. And this, of course, is the, the federal government, uh, partly through the budget, partly through the excess crude account, has been tipping money into what it hopes are going to be large infrastructure projects. But, um, of course, we have to wait for those to be completed. I mean, you mentioned the excess crude account, and this takes us to the perennial issue, that it's a major uh, exporter and producer of crude oil the world over, but it has too heavy a reliance on oil for foreign exchange revenues. The figure is about 90%, we're told. Constantly, the authorities are being urged to diversify the economy for new and alternative revenue sources. But somehow, Nigeria can't shake itself off oil. Why is that? Yes, no, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the key question, in fact. And, well, it, up to recently, it hasn't made much effort. Yes, it is. Uh, virtually all the foreign exchange comes from, from oil. And also, budget revenues are largely driven by oil, which uh, creates periodic pressure on the currency, which I think you mentioned one of your earlier conversations uh, highlighted. But uh, w why they're unable to do it, why they're unable to, to, to diversify, it's because it's been difficult to attract investment to Nigeria, domestic investment as, as much as uh, foreign investment. And this is really where the second round of reforms came in. There was the first round of reforms, which was the when uh, Madame Ngozi was a fin finance minister. This was the second uh, Abbasanjo administration. And uh, those uh, proved their worth. But to get to the next leg, we need the second set of reforms. And uh, as, as I said, these are waiting for the election, really, to, to, uh, to come by. I mean, there, there's no shortage of uh, entrepreneurship in Nigeria, as we all know. Yeah. And um, there's uh, no shortage of, uh, of determination. But um, more financial deepening is needed and more, uh, more investment in the infrastructure. It's but, um, you know, I think um, prospects, as you say, you talk about the last 50 years, maybe we should isolate the last 10 since uh, 99. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's, uh, there's been a step up, certainly. All right, you talk about the need for financial deepening, and we've seen um, intervention at the CBN level around banks um, and also beyond sort of uh, bank bailouts and the setting up of an AMCON to buy back toxic assets and the like. We're seeing the bank, the central bank, taking a stand on universal banking and saying that you can't just have a situation where retail banks are operating as merchant banks. You've got to try to get a more coordinated approach. Going forward with all these interventions, do you think we will see financial deepening in Nigeria? Well, certainly the central bank's been very active in the last year, as you pointed out, and a whole range of initiatives. On, well, on the universal banking, just to say, you know, there could be some uh, compromise solution, let's say, um, so that you can have part separation, perhaps, of uh, banking functions. On, uh, on the question of the bailout, yes, I mean, AMCON is, uh, well, AMCON, of course, now 
AMCON now has some provisional directors and has a provisional chair and a provisional chief executive as of earlier this week. But um, it is the, the, the healthy banks, uh, those which weren't bailed out, are really waiting for, mostly waiting for AMCON to see how it pans out before mm -hmm. they start increasing their loan books. So this looks more like end of this year, early 2011. And well, there's a second point about increasing your loan books, which is that um, you know a bank might be very keen to increase its loan book, but it might um, not find many suitable uh, credit proposals for it to do so. So th this is also slowing down uh, the the deepening. But no, the deep the deepening the deepening had a, had a large the deepening had a major leg up after bank consolidation 2005, mm -hmm. and uh, we're hoping that as of next year there'll be another major leg up. Because you know the the, the level of um, bank uh, of bank, bank bank lending to GDP in South yeah. in South Africa is something like twice the level of uh, Nigeria. Okay, and obviously, if we can see a more improved financial system, it means better uh, credit facilities for budding entrepreneurs. You refer to manufacturers and the like. Let's talk about the social inequalities in Nigeria. The fact that despite all the human capital potential. Um, the gap between the rich and the poor is just excessive in that country and it's been a problem since independence. Well, I think uh, this is probably a function of um, being an emerging market or um, being a function of a country without a social, social safety net. I mean, how, how actually um, a, a government or governments compress the gap in income between uh, the rich and the poor, as you say, actually is by legislation, by setting up a, a welfare state or something approaching it. And so until you, you do that, and there is, there is necessarily a large gap. So in Nigeria, maybe the gap is larger in other countries, but I, I shouldn't have thought so, than other frontier markets. I think that would be the proper parallel. But um, you, know, you, you create, a, basically, you narrow the gap because you create wealth. And um, at some point, the, you know, the state has some role in um, providing some form of safety net. But, you know, to do that, you have to be in a, fiscally in a stronger position. All right. And finally, I mean, Nigeria has this aspiration to be a G20 economy by the year 2020. Um, institutions like Goldman Sachs, Standard Chartered say it's possible if they can just plug the infrastructure deficit. From your assessments, is it possible? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, you know, yeah, I'd go along with that. You know, you can, you know, you, you have the BRIC countries, of course, and then you can form all sorts of combinations and you can do a bit of modelling and stick a few countries in there because they've got a large population or possible large consumption growth. So you can do all that. But uh, actually what you're waiting for is uh, what you're talking about, which is um, do something with the infrastructure. I mean, the, the governor of Central Bank, uh, Governor Sanusi, one of his, uh, you know, he's a very quotable person, and one of his uh, points made in public is that, look, you know, we're growing by 7% and we have no power and we have, we have very little credit. Uh, but inference, of course, if we have uh, power and credit, we're growing in double digits. 